here's the game plan for the next uh, two or three lectures. We're going to I'm going to start by talking about the chemical forces that are important for the structure and function of these biomolecules. And then I'm going to relate them as we go along to how, how these properties influence the, character, influence the characteristics of these key uh, macromolecules. And in particular, we'll be talking about covalent bonds, hydrogen bonds, ionic bonds, a force known as van der Waals forces. And something, it's not really a force, but it's a characteristic that's very important, particularly when we think about proteins and lipids, called hy um, hydrophobicity. Literally, fear of, fear of water. And then the order of the molecules that, as we, we talk, well, I'll talk about carbohydrates first. Try and get to that today. Then we'll talk about proteins, uh, nucleic acids. And lipids in that order. And as you'll see, we can these two will be sufficient to understand most of the characteristics of carbohydrates, whereas we're going to understand all five, need all five of these to. Uh, be able to get an intelligent understanding of, um, of uh, how pro proteins work. Now, I'll sort of caution you. It's going to seem, God, he's going to talk about covalent bonds. Is everybody rolling his, their eyes? Um, I heard about covalent bonds in grade one or something. But um, the difference here is that we're going to be looking at some of the, these uh, forces, some of which you've been exposed to already but from a biological perspective. And I hope if you kind of watch that, you'll begin to see that you're looking at something that may be sort of familiar to you, but you have to start thinking about it in a different way once you start thinking of what are the implications of the properties of these forces and the way these molecules behave uh, for, for biology. So begin with the one that everybody undoubtedly knows, which are Covalent bonds, and as this is the principal force that holds uh, holds atoms together, and it's based on sharing of electrons. And as I'll say, these are very strong bonds. And so, in the simplest sort of example, hydrogen atom has one unpaired electron, a carbon has four, and so you can make methane. CH4, and commonly in chemistry and biology, we use a line to represent a pair of electrons. So there's methane. Um, as I said, if, apart from uh, you know it burns, if you go out in a swamp and, or in a beach and you see bubbles buddy bottom coming up, those are bubbles of methane made by methanogens that are living in the anaerobic layer underneath. A cow has a special fermentation digestion uh, cap cavity inside. It's huge, called a rumen, stuff sloshing around. And it's full of uh, archaea that are methanogens. And as I said, a cow makes about 400 liters of, of methane a day. And Penny will tell you it's a very bad greenhouse gas. It's much more potent than carbon dioxide. And uh, so the typical length of a covalent bond is about 1.5 to 0 0.2 nanometers. And hope you'll try and begin to get uh, a sense of um, some of these, uh, the links of some of these things, too. But um, the key point about this is that the energy to break a covalent uh, bond, uh, a carbon-carbon So to break a carbon-carbon bond needs 83 kilocalories per mole. So that's a lot of energy if at 
25 degrees centigrade. If you take, a, a, say, a typical vibrational mode of a, of a covalent bond, the energy that it has is about 0 0.6 kcals per mole. So what, what that means is that covalent bonds don't break on their own at, under physiological conditions. They can bend. They can rotate. And they can stretch so can back and forth this way. They can go this way, this way, but they don't break. And so one of this sort of leads to another topic that uh, we'll talk about, which is utterly key. It's one of the secrets to how life works are these protein molecules that are known as enzymes. And we'll also talk a little bit about a similar thing made of RNA called a ribosome, a ribozyme. But what these are are biological catalysts that enables specific bonds, and this is important, specific bonds to be broken or formed under physiological conditions. And this part is so important. If you're trying to work out a chemical reaction, the original process for fixing nitrogen, taking nitrogen gas, making ammonia, the Haber process involved some very, very tough uh, uh, molecule to break the bond of. So the, just heat it up to 500 degrees and put in a catalyst. But if you're a living organism, you don't have that option. You have to continually make and break bonds under the conditions the very, very narrow conditions where life is, uh, is possible. If you go a little too high, things like proteins unfold, and then they don't work as properly as, as machines anymore. So we'll be talking more about that as we go along. There are different types of covalent bonds. And again, the, the first part of this isn't going to surprise you. There are single bonds like this. There are um, double bonds and triple. Excuse me. I'll stay with carbon for the moment. The more electrons that are shared, the stronger the bond. And this, these two are referred to, if it's a, if it's a carbon compound, as being unsaturated bonds, the same term you hear when you hear about unsaturated fats and what that means. A fat with an unsaturation that's unsaturated will have somewhere in it uh, a double bond, or in some cases, many uh, double bonds. However, there's another aspect of this which might not have been relevant to you, but you'll see it becomes relevant for thinking about proteins as soon as the next lecture. And that is this bond, a single bond, it's able to rotate this way. These guys can't rotate. And that, as you'll see, becomes important in quite a variety of uh, situations. But we'll run into a, a very uh, important example of that when we're thinking about uh, the very backbone of, of all all proteins, the, the peptide bond, which is at the heart of being a protein. There are other molecules that have more than one bond that are important. Oxygen is one. And nitrogen, as I said, is a particularly hard uh, nut to crack. The capacity, most organisms, as I said the other day, are unable to break this, this bond. The or only organisms that have learned how to do it are bacteria 
the vast majority of them use one single enzyme called nitrogenase that evolved that's very complicated enzyme and has very, very stringent requirements and needs a huge energy input. But it is able to crack this bond and get it made into uh, ammonia. But it's a, an example of another molecule that has, has, a, has a triple bond in it. Um, let's see, how are we doing here? OK. So another um, aspect of, of these bonds that, of, of uh, covalent bonds that we think of, uh, need to think about is, has to do, uh, when you're thinking about carbon, it's, it's a property called chirality. And it comes from the fact that carbon has four bonds, but they come out as a tetrahedron. So if that doesn't matter in the case of methane, but I'm going to depict the tet tetrahedron in this way so that this bond is coming. These two are in the plane of the board. This one's coming out. That one's going back. And let's just put on four different substituents. Now, if I get the mirror image of that, we will have these two molecules are called optical isomers. And if you sit down and stare with, play with this, you will find you can't convert one to the other without actually physically breaking a bond. And this is really important, because one of the central concepts that I hope you might remember from this, this course, because it cuts across a lot of the stuff we're going to talk, we'll be talking about, is that at a At a molecular level, much of bi biology relies on the interaction of complementary three D surfaces. We're actually very familiar with this at a macro level in our, our, uh, our own lives. Imagine you've just come back from the party late on Saturday night. You're crossing the Mass Ave Bridge. The wind is howling. You're freezing, but no problem. You've got your gloves. And you reach in your pocket, and you have two left gloves. No matter what you do, <laughs> you can't get that right hand to fit properly into the left-handed glove. So we see this thing even up at a, uh, one's a mirror image of the other. But we run into this problem even our, in our own lives when you saw that, uh, how that DNA had fit right into a groove in the, uh, in the um, protein. If we had a mirror image of the DNA or we had a mirror image of the protein, it wouldn't work. And this principle goes all the way through, um, all the way through biology. There is another characteristic of um, covalent bonds that we're going to need to, oops, Daisy, yeah, that becomes important uh, again. And that is depending, it's how equally the electrons are sharing. So again, it goes back to the sharing of electrons, but with a twist. If we have a carbon-carbon or a carbon-hydrogen bond, pretty much equal sharing. And this is known as a non-polar bond. And if we, oops, sure, yeah, okay. uh, but if you have a nitrogen or an oxygen bond, it's unequal. And these are known as polar bonds. And the, the term that's used to describe this unequal sharing of, of uh, electrons is known as the electronegativity 
depends on the electronegativity of the atom. Um, it's basically a word that means the greediness of, the, of a particular atom for electrons. So if you have an oxygen and a hydrogen bond, although we write it like that on the board, and you've undoubtedly seen this for many years in, in chemistry, in fact, the electrons spend more time down here than they spend up there. So there's a little bit of a negative charge on the uh, oxygen and a little bit of a plus charge on the hydrogen, that's usually represented by a little delta to indicate that this has a wee bit of, of, um, of negative charge, that is a wee bit of, um, of positive charge. And a molecule that's very important with respect to this is water. Because water, as you know, is H2O, but it's not symmetrical. The angle here is 105 degrees, and so um, Water, the oxygen has a little bit of a negative charge, but each of these has a little bit of a plus charge. It's actually, water's 55 molar. So it's a, um, a little dipole. You got 55 molar of these little dipoles going on. And if we, uh, this property of uh, electronegativity and nonpolar bonds, then leads to um, another, the second of the forces that we're going to, to be talking about. That's force number two. And that's a hydrogen or H bond. And this is a bond that's made possible by the little bit of a negative charge that's on oxygen or nitrogen or a few other molecules and the little bit of a positive charge that's, that's um, due to the hydrogen that's in a, in a polar bond. And where uh, this is very important for, um, as you'll see, for proteins. nucleic acids and for, uh, and for carbohydrates. And it has a huge amount to do with the way that water behaves. Because in that 55 molar water, you'll have one water molecule that's going to be like this. And there'll be another water molecule down here with a little bit of a negative charge. And this little bit of a plus charge on this hydrogen, a little bit of a negative charge, can form what's known as a hydrogen bond between them. And what's especially important about these hydrogen bonds is they're about 1 20th the strength of a covalent bond. And that means that in a distribution of molecules at physiological temperatures, there will be some guys up in the, the most energetic molecules within the bunch will have um, enough energy to break hydrogen bonds. But they're much easier to do. And just to peer ahead, when we talk about replicating DNA, those two strands are held together by uh, hydrogen bonds. So the backbones are really solid, just like two strips of Velcro or something. But the hydrogen bonds are about 120 that hold them together, the two strands together, but 120 is the strength. So it's basically like molecular Velcro between the two, the two strands of DNA. And we'll see uh, some more examples of this. So I mean, this is a, this, let's see if I can go back to this, get this thing to play. This is a sort of static representation, just illustrating this. But in fact, uh, what happens, water molecules are continually changing partners. So they're constantly making shells and cages and so on. And this is a, the next little movie is a picosecond simulation of water at zero, just at zero degrees. And you can sort of see how the molecules are kind of changing partners, making little shells and things. And here's a picosecond simulation of a 
uh, water at the boiling temperature. And what you can see from this is every now and then a molecule like this one will get enough energy to break out of this constant shearing of little hydrogen bonds and, uh, and, to, um, and to escape. And another thing, when we talk about getting something dissolved in water, this is something we'll have to think about. Because if you try and dissolve something in water, like stir a lot of oil into it, you know what happens. You can stir like mad, and it doesn't go in. And part of the problem is, if you put something into water, it's going to have to break these existing hydrogen bonds. And that's an energy cost. So in order to get something to dissolve, you're going to have to get the energy back. And we'll be talking about that. But it's a, one of the fundamental parts of uh, water. Um, you're familiar with the characteristics that give water is surface tension. It's why trees can grow 300 feet tall, because they've got basically little nanotubes and little capillaries. And with this uh, surface tension water due to hydrogen bonds, you can go 300 feet up. Just the water can go right up. You've seen water bugs walk around on water. There's a particularly interesting uh, lizard in South America, Central America, called the bal uh, basilisk lizard that's about two and a half, two, two and a half feet long, uh, that um, it's able to run across the top of the water. It's actually called the Jesus Christ uh, <laughs> lizard. And it's able to do that because of this uh, surface tension in the water. In fact, when I, when I finished my PhD thesis, I went in a competition for the theses. And I, mine was something like a chemical enzymatic synthesis of oligoribonucleotides. And I was competing against the guy with, who said, you know, why do lizards run on water? And his entire talk consisted of movies of this thing running across the water. And I thought I was toast. But anyway, I actually won that prize. But anyway, every time I see this, I remember it. Um, and this also why when, for example, they go explore Mars or think about planets, they're always looking for water, because it has this very, very special set of properties that are so important for, for life. 